Bill Merchant, historian and curator here at the DNH Canal Historical Society. Our museum here at 23 Mohunk Road in High Falls will be closed in two years, so we created the Virtual Museum, short three to seven minute segments that will tour you through this museum while we still can. I hope you enjoy. In this episode of our virtual tour of the DNH Canal Museum here in High Falls, we're going to discuss what it took to construct a canal in the early 19th century. We've already uh, discussed the route, uh, and that's an important thing because before you can build a canal, you have to know what it is you need to build. You have to know how many locks. You have to know what's going to be the best way to go. So you need to hire folks like this, engineers. We've already discussed the route that was uh, determined by engineers under the uh, supervision of this man right here, Judge Benjamin Wright of Erie fame. Judge Wright was so sought after that when the brothers, the Wurtz brothers, hired him to survey a route, he actually had two gentlemen, a Colonel Sullivan and a Mr. Mills, uh, who did the work under his supervision. He hired and trained James McEntee and John Jervis on the Erie Canal. They were both Western New York uh, boys, uh, grew up in the western part of New York State, and both learned civil engineering and surveying under Judge Benjamin Wright. John Jervis particularly important because in the summer of June of 1826, he replaces the very busy, very sought after Judge Wright as chief engineer of the DNH Canal. So much of what we was constructed, what uh, uh, in that earliest construction of the canal was really the work of John Jervis based on the survey that was supervised by this gentleman here. So before we even get, in, get into the idea of how you actually build it, how do you lay it out? What we've got here, <laughs> you know, I can't find the key. We're going to have a problem getting into this case when it's time to move. Um, <laughs> I'll find it somewhere, folks. Problem with uh, volunteer organizations, uh, not enough of an org, uh, yeah. Institutional memory, that's the thing. So this is a transit level. We've got the legs for this. Uh, in the new museum, I'd like to see this displayed on its original legs. But this is a device that you'd set up. Let's see if we get a better look over here. Sorry about the glare, folks. As I said, can't get into the case right now, so this is what we got, right? And this is a surveyor's level. There's a, actually referred to as a transit. And they would set this up on a stand and level it out perfectly. You can see the two levels either side. Uh, they'd get their exact bearing with that compass and they'd sight with these sights. Maybe we'll come down here and see if we can actually get a sense of the sighting. What do you say? Right? So here we go. The lights can not help us here. But yep, you'll be sighting right down. You're going to have to line up the two sites, and then you'd know that you had a full level. It's very important that you're completely level with a canal. I think water runs level to within like an inch across three miles, something. Somebody who knows this better will correct me at some point. There must be a spot to comment somewhere here, huh? So once you finally did lay out the canal route, and as we know, 108 miles, originally with 110 locks, that's a lot of stuff to build. It ended up costing probably $2 million total. They raised $1.5 million. Uh, in their initial stock offering and got 10% on that. Uh, 500000 of that was able to be used for banking, a way for the nascent company to sh get some value for their shareholders. But then you'd use things like this. This is a D&H pickaxe right here. Let's see if we can read the stamp. How do we know it was there, as you say? Well, at DHC... DNHC Company, the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company, they're in a pickaxe. I get tired just uh, looking at these things, huh? They had pickaxes. We know that there were 2,500 men and 200 teams, according to a, either Albany or Kingston paper, depending on who you talk to. Um, haven't found that paper yet. I'm looking for it. Uh, they were engaged on the work early on. They, uh, the initial groundbreaking was July 13th of 1825, in Dr. Morrison's yard in Rome, New York. Not the one you're thinking of, but Mama Kading, uh, what's now known as Wurtsboro. 
Uh, they broke ground there. That was part of the 17-mile summit level. Very common that uh, early canals would start in a nice, easy stretch where all they had to do was dig a ditch. None of those pesky locks and stuff like that to have to build. Just make me a ditch. Uh, this ditch was 32 foot wide at the top, 20 foot wide at the bottom, what we call the prism uh, because of its shape. And it was uh, four foot deep, uh, initially built to uh, accommodate boats, 75 foot long, nine foot wide, that could carry up to 30 tons of coal. Those early boats probably cost about $400 in the era. The company uh, company had the boats made and sold them to you. But that gets away from our story. We're talking construction. So here we've got a pair of D&H Canal Company shovels. Shovels are awful important. And their final enlargement of 1850, which expended another $2 million of dollars. Uh, at one point, they ordered 2,270 shovels at one pop from the Ames Shovel Company. Uh, gives you a sense of how they did that work. They also used blasting powder, black powder. Uh, we didn't have dynamite at the time. And maybe we'll cut to a, a black powder site to talk more about that. Thank you so much for joining us in our virtual tour. New episodes will be put up every week. Hope you enjoy.